Thank you for that warm welcome. Can't believe I'm standing here. <laughs> belonging or theater of the belonging. Belonging to theater. When I was about 12, I was racing home from school, not eager from, to depart from lessons learned or thrilled to be relieved of a boring class or even to get home to watch my favorite TV show. I was racing against the whizzing of rocks that were being hurled at me by three of my cohorts. I think I misremembered. Two of them were younger than me uh, in the seventh grade. They said my tallness meant we couldn't get into a fair fight. There were three of them and one of me. So they slung rocks instead. The end result is another moment where I felt in the community I was born and raised that I did not belong. So I wrote it into a play once. Here's an excerpt from Without Sin. Today, another test he failed. The boys gathered around him, the incantation, it is time to put away boyish things. Are you ready? Reynaldo, the lead character, says, if boyish things are put away, then we become women. Have you become women? By the looks, no. Still young, lean, men, hard. Another test he failed. This, inqu this inquisition he ran from, tired of the beatings almost every day, so he ran, like all good sinner men do. All good sinner men run. He ran on for a long time. You may run on for a long time. And the boys gave chase. They forgot themselves. They thought they were David and used stones against Reynaldo's Leviathan abomination. You may run on for a long time. Down the streets, they cast the first and last stones. They rained down from heaven, grazing his face, barely touching his cheeks. They hailed down. They spun by. They zipped by his ears like mosquitoes, like rattled down from raven sky. They splashed onto asphalt and skipped as if on a creek, as if it were a lovely day for rock skipping, skipping rocks, skipping. Reynaldo ran on for a long time. You may run on for a long time, but it stopped. The rocks stopped. Reynaldo looked to heaven. His feet slowed on the earth. The boys closed in on him, but they stopped chucking rocks. Are they crazy? Por que nada? No, Reynaldo. No. Look where you are, where you stand. You are near the cars. The cars have precious glass made out of sand. They won't break the replaceable glass. No, they will not. Reynaldo's heart broke. I am less than glass? Sand burned in the fire is greater than me? No further will I run then. I will stay and take my lesson like a man. For if now I died, at least I can become as precious as sand. And they beat him. They beat him near death. When that play premiered, who was in that audience? I know if I were there in that place, I could feel like I belonged. I know friends tormented by the boys on the block near death. My friend Darnell, who's an activist, a pastor, and a scholar, he could amen that scene because the time he was surrounded by boys that stole his dirt bike and proceeded to pour the gasoline they had siphoned from it onto him in order to burn him as one burns a faggot. Or mayhaps Alvin Ailey, if ever he saw that scene, if he were alive, he would know that song, Run On For A Long Time, that it spoke not just about running towards a redemption, but a redemption you can never find, which is why you run on for a long time. Where I failed, as all early artists do, is at the time of writing that, I was only thinking about my pain, never barely doing what Baldwin had charged me to do, which was tell the whole truth. The truth is, those boys told me I didn't belong, and I knew they were wrong. I belonged to that community, and so did they. 
The truth is, my hurt made me paint them a villain, when in truth, the violence that they visited on me was already all around me and in them. For example, who taught them that my black life mattered less than the glass on those cars? Who made it apparent to them that car life was the only way to drive? That is not an innate feeling. In fact, one would argue that knowing the threat of my animated self in proximity to them, the other in the room, made them doubt their own existence and prompted the conflict. And now I am not making excuses for those boys, these bullies. I am, however, investigating my charge in life. The artist's job is to hold up the old and whole truth to humanity, everyone's. Am I crafting work and theater only for a slender few to engage and relive, to feel some gratification in seeing self? Or am I investigating a truth with people who I love in a community so that we may come to solutions or at least awareness? I don't know. But this is at the root of theater of belonging. Hi, my name is Terrell Alvin McCraney. I'm a playwright most of the time. My preferred pronouns are he, him, but I will answer to girl, her, never boy. Giving honor to God whom I oft wish as the head of my life, I struggle daily to keep this head above water. That is the truth. The truth is my faith is something larger, but my fear of human frailty is formidable. That day, running from Jeffrey and the other boys who chased me and rocked me. I was in different portions of myself all at the same time, even at 12. I feared running further into the projects because there anything could happen. I felt ashamed that I was afraid in the neighborhood I was born and raised in and had learned to walk, ride, and speak on. I was excited because I spent time thinking about dirty red Jeffrey with his tight eyes. I wish he weren't so mean because I could love to taste him, even at 12. And yet, wasn't that the reason why Jeffrey was chasing me down the corridors of Liberty City? Couldn't he sense that my 12-year-old larger, blacker self could reduce him somehow? Isn't it true that he had learned a misogyny and that it kicked in? And so in order for him to not feel like he was weaker or the girl, he let his homophobia blossom before our very eyes. Homophobia is just misogyny aimed at women, at men. And that's what Jeffrey was feeling. He took a hatred of femininity and aimed it at me. <laughs> now, what was I to do with these notions coming at me at the same time? Why add them to the list of things that just didn't belong here? My vulnerability didn't belong here. My talents didn't belong here. My interests didn't belong here. And those, were, those teachers were right. They don't like me, they said, because I'm smarter. They told me the white kids are nicer to you because you are more like them. What fuckery. <laughs> you later learn that the white kids are happy to have a token. And that it's taught to them very early that to be in great possession of many kinds of friends from all over. Just don't marry them. Ask Caesar. Ask Antony. And so my steps towards creating theater of belonging is already filled with intellectual anti-black bullshit that I must undo. Thank you, Jeffrey, for the rocks and all. Where do I belong? Where do they belong? The WPA relief program advanced what we think of as a community theater and had a wonderful splinter effort between commercial theater making and regional non-for-profit. Indeed, some of our largest theater companies outside of New York found their way into existence because of programs like this. The division on Broadway is palpable and breaks down more among standard British class fare. Those who have means to attend, attend. And those who don't, don't. As I said before, I'm a playwright and I tend to make my living, quote unquote, in that place that claims to be interested in being open. And yet community theater in these climes is anathema. When in truth, it is how these theaters got started with the remit to provide for the community, a place where art and artistry can be cultivated, appreciated, and celebrated in our community. 
all across the nation, most of these theaters are wrestling with the very real question of how do we get the community engaged without calling it community theater. Calling the theater you do community means you don't aspire to be nominated by Tony. But you hope he will walk in from the corner and find comfort at the footlights. In order to invite the block boy inside, that would mean awakening the idea that the cell phone using often bored with the old way, queer brown and black faces that are often at the forefront of culture making have to not only be allowed to perform, but produce by them for them. Instead, we, me, write well-structured dramas steeped in a history of Western performance and hope to God that some student will say our work saved their lives. But plays, no, nor art of any kind actually saves lives. It is in the discourse caused by the collective imagining of beauty and horror supreme that shifts lives into action. And that's how culture is belonging. When we share those moments, when someone looks at art, the synapses that fires in their brain and the movement in their heart makes the change, not the art itself. So how do we keep the engagement? If people knew that they could come and be challenged in a safe space by dangerous ideas, don't you think they would keep coming back? <laughs> Not for the Hamilton ticket price, they wouldn't. <laughs> but this is how capitalism has made the most democratic and collaborative art form almost obsolete. How have the artistic and intellectual elite allowed ourselves to tarry away from being truth tellers? Remember when the vice president was heckled at a Broadway show? Remember how the president said the theater is supposed to be a safe space? And I might throw up in my mouth a little bit for saying this, but he was right. I have watched as theater, my own included, lulled a white upper middle class audience into taking a small sojourn into the lives of others and safely returning back to their own thoughts without a single check or balance. That is a theater they belong to. President Trump signaled that he and his cohorts belong to a theater, and that is safe for them, always. The theater I belong to isn't safe from ideas, though. It may be free of violence visited on my person, and yes, I want to be able to be my full mask, femme, whatever the fuck self in the relation to it, but I need theater to scare the shit out of me. I want to walk home shaking. I want to create theater that frightens me. The only way towards that is to follow women, particularly black and brown queer women, assigned or trans. I know that's a whole other conversation, but take into account this, spell number seven by Ntozaki Shange, the choreo poem that rocked the notion of women of color creating their own art. Susan Laurie Parks's Father Comes Home From War or Katori Hall's Anything. Consider this, once a theater not too far from here got brave and said community theater means going into the community rather than bussing the community to us. It means taking a play and placing it where it's set while not disturbing the community, allowing the community to come to it. Marin Theater took my play in the red and brown water, a story about a young woman in the projects who desperately wants to have a baby and put it inside the housing projects in Marin City. I was nervous. If you know me, I rarely get nervous about plays, only about speaking to large audiences. But I was. The politics of a play about a young girl who wants to get pregnant are not respectable. They are human, they are natural, they are true to the way that I was born into the world. But what would the community say? How would they engage? Would they even pay attention? Would I get chased out with rocks again for bringing a play with certainly queer overtones to a, the center of black and brown community? Find out next week on Terrell McCraney's Lit.
That is what the theater of belonging should feel like. The artists should be terrified that the questions that they are asking, unearthing, in their work may show some beautiful, horrible truths to the audience and community, and the community should have love for that artist for engaging them in something so tantalizing. The good note from that experience is that there was a woman pl playing Aunt Elegua, which is a character from In the Red and Brown Water. Now, we all have an Aunt Elegua. If you're black, she's often played by Jennifer Lewis in about everything. But the actress playing Aunt Elegua in this production was Don L. Uh, Troop Massey, who actually is from the Bay Area. And she had to contend in that moment with Aunt Elegua the Living, who lived in Marin City. She was living Orisha made flesh. Basically, there was an older woman who was the embodiment of the character in the neighborhood. And she saw our little play and snapped. Like that, we were in West African dance, where not those designated to dance can't perform, but sometimes the spirit moves a member of the community, and they start to call and respond back. Like that, the crowd was responding, watching who could out Elegua the other Elegua. It was alive. It was amazing. And though I had not grown up there, I belonged there, because the audience was telling me, oh, we have you here. David Diggs, who later went on to become a Hamilton stardom, I think it was his second play, he was also a part of this cast, and he was harassed by the living Aunt Elegua. She thought he was cute. <laughs> and told him so. Ooh, you cute! Later in the play, when David's character admits to less than heteronormative tendency, she yelled, ooh, you nasty! Not as a rebuke, but as surprise. She was literally yelling lines from the play because a little later, the main character says the same damn thing about him. <laughs> we were belonging in that moment. It's been damn near 10 years since I had that experience, and I wonder often where the road turned, Diana. For me, I am, I've been chasing that belonging, knowing this. I cannot create it. I must return to it by first returning to my community. But let's talk about some, something else, someone else for a second, which is infinitely easier for me. Medea. My mother died from AIDS-related complications when I was 23. I had recently graduated from undergrad, so I was broke, jobless, and I needed to return to rural Georgia where she lived to bury her. All I had was writing. All I could do was write. Write a speech for graduation. Write a speech for my mother's eulogy and services. Write within those margins a little play called In Moonlight Black Boys Look Blue. I had been accepted to the Yale School of Drama and I'm only telling you that part because of my cousins. My cousins descended on my, on my mother's funeral like seraphim towards the light of God. I was afraid, as I always am, that I would, like I always am, be opposite, be pushed out, be thought different. Knowing the stigma around AIDS, knowing the hardship of the funeral, knowing the shame I wore for being gay in the proximity of the South, in the proximity of the virus, in the proximity of my cousins made, me sh made sure that I knew that I was an Alvin first, and that was the only A they were concerned with. So we had a good time at a funeral. And somehow, over really amazing food, I think it was mac and cheese or something, these cousins asked me about school, and I told them I was going to drama school for playwriting. Mind you, this is 2003. They oddly knew what a playwright was. Again, there go my anti-black magic Negro, Negro blinders. They were just starting to come off, so please forgive me. In fact, they said they were loving plays at the moment, that they had video of plays in their car. Currently, one of them said they were watching Medea. And I thought, my God, I am the truest sense of bias fraud. 
Here I am thinking my family will reject me and push me away when all they are doing now is watching a 2,000-year-old play about a woman who kills her kids in order to exact revenge on misogyny-ridden, xenophobic world. I should have known better. My family's the bomb. My cousin, who said it was a copy in her car, ran out. And I asked, is it the RSC version? <laughs> 45 minutes later, I sat down watching Tyler Perry be Madea, and my face glowed as I blushed. I also laughed my ass off. Here was someone doing exactly what he was called to do in a way he was creating a sense of belonging. My cousins saw themselves in those plays. I saw myself in those plays most of the time, and they were engaging, full of song and dance, call and response, moral through lines that our community has always enjoyed in a theater, except it didn't stay with me. The jokes did, but never the spiritual engagement. Now, I'm not here to castigate Mr. Perry's work or any of the urban circuit theater movement, also known as the Chitlin Circuit. I am here to learn from it as all artists need to from each other. The circuit pressured by capitalism and the gospel of prosperity has left something cold in the pieces. I know some of my more craft-leaning friends call to the work file the stereotypes, but I, I don't buy that. I know these people. I am these people. The tropes aren't the characters, aren't the problem. It's the storytelling. There are truths being left out. And as I have told you, I am guilty of this as well. The most harmful tropes are the notion of complete and utter earthly transformation. Not the sometimes imperceptible movement of the spirit, the inner burning light towards freedom from material, capitalistic, or cultural mores that make black life unbearable. No, but the acceptance of redemption. If you believe in Jesus, all will be over. All will be great. I remember watching those and thinking, well, what about the times that mama relapsed? What about the times we prayed and she didn't get better? Instantly, I knew I didn't belong then. So what did that say about me? Still, I don't know the answer of belonging. I wanted to write the, des the desperation of losing a parent, even though having prayed over her. I tried to write it out with a piece that I wrote for Cheryl and Bruce, called Head of Passes. That was at Berkeley a little while ago. I also tried to give those words of longing to Felicia Rashad in the latest production. Here's from Head of Passes, Sheila's speech. Ain't good for nothing, excuses, excuses. Excuse you, Sheila, good for nothing, because nothing's left, nothing's here. Nothing saved these nothing, they all gone. Only person left here is me. And I tell you, Father God, I command you, Master, I tell you, put it on me, put it on me. Where are you? Show yourself. Where are you? I'm tired of hearing creaking house. You hear me? You hear me. The doctors say I won't have long till the voice will give out where I won't be able to gather up air or energy to talk on. Well, I will stop wasting it then. I stop talking to him. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you. You, with the breath, you can restore life. That's the promise. I can blink, and, and again, the loves of my life will have theirs. I swear, please. And she hears nothing. After promising and battling with God, there is nothing to be heard. Those are identical thoughts that I had had, identical talks that I had had with the Lord, yet there were so few black and brown faces in the audience that, again, the audience just sat more watching an exhibit of black face than engaging it, except one Sunday. Come Sunday. The theater of belonging isn't consistent enough just now which is why I charge my students every day to think about their audience. I would be remiss if I, didn't, if I didn't mention the first times I felt theater of belonging by a local author, Mr. Marcus Gardley, who's here from the Bay Area. Literally, he made me watch a play where a former slave fell out of a tree, became a woman, then became a tree again by the roots. The Mississippi herself stood up and spoke, and Jesus literally moonwalked across the waters. I knew who I was in that play, and I knew what that play was asking me to do. Often, what we make is th of theater is telling you exactly what you want to be true. The greatest political minds are telling us how theater of belonging works, 
at grassroots, small communities-led initiatives that ask the talent of the community to engage. When we asked Tony and Jeffrey to come inside and look at how we can live, then we don't pretend to belong, we actually do. Thank you all for listening.